Hi, everybody. Welcome to Chicanismo 101 uh, with the subject of Aslan being discussed today by Ernesto uh, Ayala from La Raza Unida. We're going to start in about 10 minutes. We're just going to wait a little longer. I know parking is kind of difficult and uh, people are just getting here. So we're going to get started around 6.40. So um, hang tight. There's a coffee shop next door. You can go support. There's a... They have a bathroom, a really nice bathroom. Please go use it. And uh, yeah, so just stay put and we'll get started soon. Thank you. I just don't like to put signs that say Margate and Final Fantasy. Like, I don't like it to be able to walk in and just buy something. I want people to feel like they could just browse and leave. You know how to say that? Other than that, you want to buy a library. 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 Thank you. Okay, I got a room working. Nice to be here. Uh, are you sitting there? Excuse me. Are you sitting there? Yeah, but there's extra seats there. Can I take the one right here? Cool. <laughs> Uh, do we have a whole section of books in Spanish? Okay, let me do this. We might have to wait till the end to browse just because everything's being turned off. Yeah, this area is right behind the Yeah. Right behind Matt. Matt, raise your hand. Welcome. Do you need a chair? I think we buy you. Thank you.
All right, we're going to get started in about two minutes, guys. So, yeah, two minutes. Um, Chairs available. Are there chairs there in the back? There should be some chairs here in the back. Yeah. 
There's a couple more chairs. There's one chair here and one in the front if anybody wants to. Move. All right, we're gonna get started. Thank you guys for coming out to be coming out tonight to our Chicanismo 101 series. You want to stand up? Sorry. Uh, so this for, for this first series, we're talking about Aslan, and we have the honor of presenting here with um Ernesto Ayala from La Raza Unida, who came here before to do an Aslan to Palestine teach in. So it's my honor to present him again. And to really go into depth into what it means to be a Chicano and what Aslan means in this day and age, because we're no longer in the 60s and 70s, as you know. And there is a lot of work being done nowadays um, to kind of like help the Chicano movement, like I guess what you could call the Chicano movement today. So I'm going to let him kind of like take it away. But before that, I'm going to let somebody give you a proper introduction to Ernesto, and that is Matt Tadillo, who's a great friend of mine and a great poet. So he's going to be doing an introduction, and then we'll go straight to Ernesto. All right. Uh, hey. So yeah, give up a react today and review a video. Woo. Uh, you know what? Uh, let me give that extra to Ernesto in a second here, but you know what I want to say is that with you know, Viva. Ernesto and I all share is uh, along with some, you know, trolls and <laughs> uh, is, is is really a commitment uh, to 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 the cause and also the fact that we're never going to apologize for who we are. And so that's really kind of the spirit of this event. And uh, it's really a great honor of mine uh, to introduce Ernesto. Um, you know, Ernesto and I we're, we're the co-hosts of uh, Radio Radio La Rasta on at 4 p.m. on KPFK, uh, along with Vanessa Bustamante. Uh, it's been a great honor of ours to, to host that show and bring on some incredible guests. And people often talk about things, you know, uh, in, in a historical fashion as like, you know, the godfather of this and the, the father of that. But, you know, in many ways, Ernesto Ayala, the former vice, oh, the, the current vice chair and former chair of La Sumida, is very much a son of the Chicano movement, a son of Chicanismo. And what a proud son he is. And we're also proud to have him. He's probably of my generation, he's the finest speaker we have, um, most unapologetic, most fiery. Uh, and one of the most brilliant people I've ever met, and he really, really does embody uh, the working class, you know, intellectual, just really straight from just like taught himself uh, and has a library, probably. I always mention this the library of Ernesto Ayala is one of the really great national treasures. You know, um, and so he, he's, he, he's an incredible, incredible figure, and uh, we all need to do more to make more people aware uh, of this man because really. I, I feel, I feel of, of all of us, he is really the like, kind of the torch we took off in this, and, and more people need to know about his work, and more people need to know about, um, about this great man. So we're all, we're all here, we're all honored, and we're all very fortunate uh, to hear the great words of the great Mr. Ayala. So, Vanessa, thank you. Well, once again, uh, thank you, Verdad. My name is Ernesto Ayala. I'm very honored to be here. I want to thank Compañera Viva um, for allowing us to, to do this presentation, Verdad. Um, this presentation comes about because obviously there's there's a lot of history that we don't know. You know, there's a lot of things that have happened in our history. There's a different perspective of looking at our history that we're not even taught, not even in Chicano studies sometimes, you know, which was supposed to be the bastion of. Chicano knowledge and philosophy and all that, and it unfortunately is not that at least anymore. But uh, so, um, the fact the past few years we've seen a lot of like incorrect ideas, uh, very uninformed conclusions come about, and a lot of it you can see online, and it's very misinformed, very wrong, very some of it even comes out very racist against Mexicanos, Chicanos. Um, so we. We've talked about you know doing stuff like this to to help pe raise people's consciousness, add a little bit more of knowledge. You can come out with your own conclusion, but take some of this knowledge home, Bella. Take some of this understanding that has uh, it basically is thousands of years in creation. I try to make the presentation include a lot of stuff, that. So um, I also 
I had to struggle with not making it too abstract and too confusing, you know, because I don't want to do that. There'd be no point to that. But I want people to at least take some of this home and, and then you can make your, your, uh, your conclusion based on that. But we want people to understand what, it, what the concept of Aslan has meant to Chicanos, to Mexicanos, to indigenous people. That because we do include ourselves as indigenous people and we are indigenous people. That. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. <laughs> so, if you have any questions, comments, uh, at the end, we'll have a, a, some time, you know, you can ask anything about the presentation. <laughs> you know, you know. Kind of sad because my, my compañera, my baby couldn't make it. But they were here last time. Maybe if you saw the video, you could hear them. Oh, well, they're, they're watching. Sorry, uh, let me just skip all of this. Yeah. How's everyone doing? Yeah. 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 How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm very, very eager to share this information with you all. <laughs> No, for reals. I mean, it, it comes from a place of, of love. For that, I mean, it's the, I'm not officially a teacher, but I wanted to be a teacher. My dad was a teacher. Uh, I grew up around a lot of educators. So, and I like learning. And I think that's something good that we should teach the younger ones to have this love for knowledge. And when you have that love for knowledge and love for your people, you want to share things that you know with your people, people in general, but with your people in particular. So Aslan, as you can see there, Aslan, <laughs> that is the obviously it's something that means a lot to our people. But that I mean, that's a restaurant named Aslan. There, you know, there's a, a cafe at the Facebook headquarters named Aslan. Um, there's a, a piece, the piece, style piece over there, a trucking school named Aslan, a park in Colorado named Aslan, and Aslan Agency, Aslan Boutique. You mean, you'll see this word all over the place. Aslan Libre, that's it down in uh, Barrio Logan. Where um, Chicano Park is over there. So go to the next slide. So I put this this uh, quote from Marx, and I think it's important because what I what I want to stress is that when you want to find the truth, it's going to take study. It's going to take you applying you know scientific methods to understand what reality is. Or that is because again we have a lot of people that they just say something online. They're like, oh, that sounds good. And then a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. But if you want to learn, if you want to understand things, you have to take time to understand it. You have to struggle with ideas and, and try to see, oh, how, how does this make sense? Let me get some more. Let me listen to this person a little more. Let me read some of this. Let me take into consideration that, you know, how do these things come about? Not just, oh, I heard it online and, oh, that's it. You know, it sounds good. So the quote is, there is no royal road to science and only those who do not dread the fatiguing climb of the steep paths have the chance to gain, of gaining its luminous summits. So, yeah, it's just a struggle. You, you know, you got to struggle with ideas. You got to, you know, study with other people because that's part of learning. You can't just do it on your own. You got to study with other people to to get expand your mind. Right? So, thought I would add that. So the next one is another quote by a great uh, man of history, Amilcar Cabral, who was a leader in uh, Guinea, Guinea Bissau. And he wrote, in this part of, directly part of what this presentation is about. The principal characteristic common to every kind of imperialist domination. So every time there's you know a colonizer, an imperialist that takes over uh, a piece of land, is the negation of the historical process of the dominated people by means of violently usurping the free operation of the process of development of the productive forces. So negation of the historical process of the dominated people. In other words, you have the dominator, the dominant, the colonizer, the imperialist, and you have the people that dominate. The people over here that are dominating already had a story. They already had, you know, their, their whole, you know, process going on about, you know, prior to, to Spain, prior to the United States, our people already had all sorts of things going on. They had, you know, their clans, their tribes, their nation states, you know, they had their culture, they had their, their battles with each other, and, you know, and all this other stuff going on, but it was ours. It was ours. It was intruded on. And we were denied that process. 
by the colonizer. First, by Spain, and then 20 something years later, by the United States. So he's just saying how that's the case in all cases where people are colonized. They're negated that process. So the point of the presentation is not to find the physical location of an ancient Aslan, but rather to explain the primordial, that's like the very essence, uh, foundation of this story, and why this story out of so many continues to exist thousands of years later. Because remember, there was like all sorts, the Mexica had a bunch of myths and stories. Other indigenous people have a bunch of stories and myths and all this and that. But the one of Aslan has been the one that's remained for thousands of years, strongest. Why is that? Every people has a creation story. The Chicanos are no different. And also, like you read in the quote before, expressed the historical process negated to us not once, but twice by both the Spanish and US invasions. And our approach, which I'll try to explain to as, as best as I can at the very end, is dialectical historical materialism, or what they call the materialist conception of history. How you see the world in history as it is. Now to begin, next. <laughs> so I like to consider the story of Aslan, the little story told millions of times at dinner tables that can derail an empire. You might have heard this story at the dinner table. You know, maybe one of your parents told you about it with friends at a Metra meeting. I know that was the case before. I don't know so much now. Chicano studies class, maybe online, and unfortunately not as much anymore. But I know when I was a kid, I heard that story at the dinner table, and I had other friends who were not in the movement, but their parents would tell them something about Aslan, or that we came from this land, that we are indigenous. So this story slash myth has been part of our culture. Is what it says there. Disclaimer. Next, please. <laughs> By talking about this, I am not stating that all Chicanos and Mexicanos are of Mexica descent. That's not even the point to this ancient story. Neither or neither, I already say that, am I stating the Mexica Empire reached as far north as what is considered the present day quote unquote southwest? And I'll explain there why the way that's in quotes. And there's Alex, that's the not. great brother. That's land. That's right. <laughs> Alex Garcia, that's land. Oh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you why Southwest. I mean, why do we consider this part of the world the Southwest? Where's the central point? Where does, you know, what is the center that we're in the Southwest? That's a very US centric term, you know. So um, that's why a lot of people just call it Aslan. We will talk more about that later on. Uh, can you talk more about what you mean by uh, Mexica descent? Starting from the Mexica people of uh, the Mexican of the of the what's it called Central Mexico. So we do need to talk, you know, about this is the the Codice. It is from the Mexica. Uh, it's called the Codice Botolini. It's called Pira de Peregrinación de Aslan. So. Um, you know, I'm trying to build the background to this story, right? So there's like the, the depiction of the person leaving uh, their island, because Aslan was supposed to be an island, and they're, you know, going over to the land, they're migrating. So in the year 1150, the Aztecas, living in their island city of Aslan, place of parents or place of wife, depending on who you ask, um, somewhere north of present day Mexico, Tenochtitlan, which today is Mexico, de Efe, Mexico City, were directed to leave and migrate south by Huitzilopochtli, which means hummingbird on the left. There were eight Calpulis that joined this migration. Calpuli is a clan. Matlacincas, Tepaneca, Chichimecas, Malinalta, Cochimilcas, Chancas, Huesotzincas, and the group of people named Azteca, who were then told by Huitzilopochtli to now come south to Mexica. So their name changed. And that's not literally why the name changed, like which the post didn't literally tell them, you know. But I think the point there is that their name changed, like 
That's an example of things changing throughout history. Groups of people change their names. Groups of people become other groups of people. Groups of people disintegrate. So that's part of human history. After 210 years, the Mexica found a symbol, which means that they there they should build their new city. An eagle on an oval holding a snake in Lake Texcoco. And there's other you know, people that say it wasn't actually a snake, it was like the symbol of fire and water. Um, I think that's probably true, but that's basically the image people know. Probably seen depictions of this at like your local restaurant or something. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly where, where that comes from. <laughs> See, that's an indigenous symbol. That's present day Mexico City. Mexico Tenochtitlan. The actual location of an ancient Aslan might never be found. But there is a story within this story that holds a significant truth, the essence of this story. Why out of so many ancient stories and myths does the one about Aslan continue to be retold thousands of years later? So what you're seeing here is a map, maybe some of you all know about this already. Um, this is a map of languages, they're called Uto Nahuatl languages. That means all these languages are related from as far north as I believe as Idaho, all the way up there, to uh, Nicaragua and Salvador. All those languages are related. Keep in mind, if they're all related, it means they have a common origin. Uto slash Uto Aztecan, a family of indigenous languages of Americas cons consisting of over 30 languages, Uto Aztecan languages are found almost entirely in the Western United States and Mexico. The name of the language family was created to show that it includes both the Ute language of Utah and the Nahuan language, also known as Azteca of Mexico. The Uto Azteca language family is one of the largest linguistic families in the Americas in terms of number of speakers, number of languages, and geographic extension. The northernmost Uto Azteca language is Shoshone, which is spoken as far north as Southern Idaho, while the southernmost is the Pipi language of El Salvador, which is a Nahuatl version, uh, of El Salvador and Nicaragua. Ethnologues give the total number of languages in the family at 61 and the total number of speakers at 1,900,412 speakers of Nahuatl languages account for over 85% of these. The homeland of the Uto Aztecan language is generally considered to have been in the southwestern United States or possibly northwestern Mexico. So the origin of these languages is believed to have been here. Next. Some notable Utonawa languages, which I'm sure we've heard of some of these, Tongba, slash Tish, Tish, depends also on who you ask. Tataviam, I mean, oh, what do you call it? That is an Utonawa language. Tataviam, which is from where I am in San Fernando Valley. Comanche, Hopi, Tarahumara, Uchon, Odom, whose homeland is divided by the US border. Uh, Shoshone, and of course, Nahuatl. So those are all, I mean, there's a bunch more obviously, right? But those are all Utonawa languages. They all have a common origin. They're all related. Even some words, you could like make the same. Again, there was a map and this book. Sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, I put it twice on purpose. And then, what's wrong? So this is a book, again, if you want to really understand this, you know, you got, because I got the book, I'm not a linguist, I don't know anything about languages and nothing like that. But I, like a long time ago when I heard of this book, I was like, man, this is interesting because I want to know more about this. I want to know about myself, the Chicano, you know. Um, so it's called The Prehistory of Western North America. The person is a linguist. They did this whole study on Utonawa languages and all their origins. proto utonawa that's what they call the original language, which they don't have an name for it. They just call it proto utonawa a common ancestral language for all Utonawa languages. And it says, in chasing the Uto Aztecans thus far, it is reasonable to assume from the data that the Uto Aztecan homeland was in the north, including the southern central valley of California, spilling over into the edge of the Great Basin and Arizona. Uto Aztecan speaking peoples ventured southward into Mexico, some arriving earlier than others. I mean, isn't that the, the, the story that we've heard of? 
linguists can prove it. They can prove it genetically. They can prove it in all sorts of ways. Finally, corn agriculture and words for it spread via Uto Aztecan speech communities northward in the American Southwest. And that's David Needham Shaw. Oh. <laughs> Southern, Southern Central Valley of California, Bakersfield. Who knew Bakersfield was so important to Chicanos? <laughs> it's a mecca for Chicanos now. Should all go there. <laughs> Maiz. Maiz originates in Mexico. And like it said very before, it spread upward with uh, Uto, Uto Nawa language community. So people that were able to relate to each other, they spoke similar languages, if not the same language, and they were able to share the, the, the Maiz with each other. So our cultures, whether you're, whatever indigenous origin you are, we all have, I mean, these are pupusas, you know, who doesn't like pupusas? I like pupusas. I'm Chicano, and I love pupusas. Ah, you know the maíz, obviously, the lotero, lotero man, our hero, yeah. national hero of Aslan. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tortillera, you know, tortillas. Who doesn't love tortillas? Este, esquites, and all sorts of stuff that we made out of corn. That's part of our foods as being indigenous people. Doesn't matter. What part of the Americas, quote unquote, Americas are from? You know, you could be from as far north as occupied Canada, all throughout, we call it Latin Mexico, South America, even the Caribbean. We all eat corn. The corn is people. We're proud of it. <laughs> the late great Roberto City Rodriguez, you know, great compañero. This is what you wrote about. You wrote about uh, corn. And this is one of his quotes from his book, Our Sacred Maiz is Our Mother. The Maiz narratives, so the stories that come from these different cultures about Maiz, are linked by similar creation stories. Stories of creator couples and of hero twins who battle lords of the winter world in a cosmic or celestial ballgame. Stories of a plumed or beautiful serpent, Kukulkan, which is Maya, or Quetzalcoatl, which is Nahuatl, and stories of attempts of various spiritual forces to create humans, first out of mud, then wood, Amber in some versions, and finally maize. It includes maize based methods of counting, time, calendars, and similar cosmovisions, including the belief in the sacredness of maize. As Mexican anthropologist Guillermo Bonfil Batalla argued, maize itself is the civilizational impulse or seed, naturally, that triggered the development of what today is known as Mesoamerica. Traces of that impulse can be seen beyond Mesoamerica through virtually all maize based cultures of Turtle Island or the Americas. Again, Roberto Cindy Rodriguez, may he rest in power. But uh, he wrote about that. He connected. There's actually a video, uh, it's on YouTube. The next one name for that. It's in now one. But he explained, he actually interviews people from all throughout the continent, you know, different tribal people, Chicanos, obviously. Este, he goes to Mexico, he goes to, I think, Bolivia and Ecuador. And he's interviewing people, they're talking, you know, they're telling about their stories about maíz. And it's interesting because he's, in, uh, he's in Arizona, I think, or North Mexico, and he's talking to someone that's, uh, Hopi or Pueblo. And they're saying how oh, this person met a Chicano person that was doing danza, and this person had words in Nawa, and like their, their language was so similar. You know, this person speaks Hopi, another person was speaking Nawa. You know, so, um, but it connects it all with corn. You know, the corn, the stories of corn, it connected with so much. So I think that's something important to take into account. Okay. It's the, the, again, the origin stories, uh, these are the hero twins. So all these different cultures here, as far as you might see as they are geographically, have similar origin stories. The Mississippian hero twins, this culture doesn't exist anymore, but if uh, any of you have heard of Cahokia in the Mississippi area, in Mississippi, that's even outside of the Southwest, quote unquote Southwest, it was a whole city that they built there. There's still remnants of it. It was just dirt mounds now or not, but there were huge pyramids made out of soil and all that that you know these people created. Well, they found that they also had this uh, hero twins in their creation stories. The, the Navajo, the name, they have the hero twins in their creation stories. And as far away as Centro America, the, if you read the Popul Vuh, the Maya also have the hero twins, Unapu and Xbalanque. So uh, as I wrote here, Mississippian cultures, Navajo and Maya, are, they're not even Uto Nahuatl speakers. Or cultures. Nevertheless, the fact that aspects of ancient creation stories amongst our people are shared in such a vast area 
I believe it's impressive. I mean, as far north as Mississippi to Guatemala and Salvador and Southern Mexico, you know, how did that even happen? You know, so we had a story that was already going on prior to colonization. And sometimes we don't even hear about it. Lalo, which is my baby's name. <laughs> and this is actually why I named him that. Uh, Lalo, as some of you might know from, if you know, like Mesoamerican or, or Mexica stories, uh, is the deity of, of water. He gave birth, or he gave life, you know, to the water and all that, brought about the spring. Well, there's drawings of Tlaloc in Texas. Ancient drawings of Tlaloc in Texas. It's Hueco Tanks State Park and uh, drawings of Tlaloc in Three Rivers, New Mexico. You know, so we have this story going on that we don't even learn about. Even if you study like uh, ancient Mesoamerica or uh, ancient, well, if you study the ancient Southwest, you will, you will learn about this, but you usually don't hear about it. So how did that even happen? How did, you know, this, this, uh, Belief in Tlaloc exists all the way north over here. No. Yes. Tlaloc is Chak Moon to the Maya. Yes. To the Hopi, Tlaloc's role is assumed by Masao. So if you can see even the way they, they depict them, the, uh, the big eyes and the kind of sharp teeth, it had all, all to do with Tlaloc. Also, these are called these are, uh, Kachina dancers. The Kachina story it comes from Tlaloc as well because it is believed that the Kachina, they will bring about the, the spring rains, the, the water. It will bring that light. So all these stories are connected. We never learn about that though. They never they, they try to make it seem as if that border that's there is like something that was there for millions of years already. That border is, we didn't put it and it's a false border. And our people have been, you know, going north and south for thousands of years. And there's evidence for that. Next, please. The Hopi themselves. The Hopi are composed of several different clans that came together to eventually become Hopi. So again, you know, their Hopi didn't always exist, but they became, a new people became. Yeah. Of those clans, it is known that the Kachina, Badger, Reed, Tobacco, Carrot, Greasewood, Bow, and Third Mesa bamboo clans originated in Mesoamerica. That's known. Do they ever teach us that? No, we don't hear about that. The Hopi Pueblo are a Utonawa uh, speaking people. And this is the Hopi parrot clan, Kachina. Do parrots exist where Hopi people are from? Does anyone know? Do parrots live in New Mexico and Arizona in the desert? No. So how, did, how do you have parrot clan in the desert? Well, they originated in Mesoamerica. Um, they know that the genetics as well. Has anyone heard of Chaco Canyon? Chaco Canyon is an ancient, ancient site in Novo Mexico. Um, it's like one of the mother cultures of the Southwest. They had macaw aviaries in Chaco Canyon. You know, so they would raise guacamayas. Again, do Wakamayas exist in this environment? No. Uh, they found these vessels made for drinking cacao, and they've even found cacao remnants in them. Does cacao grow in this environment? No. Right, so uh, there was something going on that we don't learn about, but it's known already. Yes. There are many other aspects of our ancient past that describes the world the historic timeline that was interrupted. Oops. Oh, oh okay. No. That was interrupted by both Spanish and U.S. colonialism. In a sense, the rebirth of the idea of Aslan thousands of years later proves that this timeline, although violently interrupted, continued to develop. But now, under a new set of conditions, we call colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism. So they intervene, but it's not like we stopped existing. We still continue to express ourselves. We still continue to develop as a people, even if we were thwarted from our, from our past. You know? So, um, but now we have to face these things. And this is a quote from este, a dear compañero, 
or uh, Dear Compañero, who's the secretary of the, of the Raza Vida as well. And he writes in his book, which is a really good book, Insurgent Aslan. Uh, the only known fact about Aslan is that the homeland of the Mexica was located somewhere to the north of central Mexico. Where exactly is unimportant. What is important is the belief in nation, entitlement, and indigeneity. I wonder why this story should survive of the countless that have perished. Even more astonishing, mainstream Anglo scholars, politicians, and political pundits of the late 20th century and early 21st century have awarded this myth some recognition. So I don't know if you all remember, but back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, when all the immigration stuff was going on, it was really big. You had a lot of the right-wing guys uh, they would go on TV and they would denounce Aslan. You know, you had all these people going on, on Fox, mainly they're like, oh, they, well, they believe in Aslan, you know, they want to take back Aslan and this and that. You know, so so these like racist guys thousands of years later are talking about Aslan. They were denouncing Mecha, they were talking trash about Mecha, uh, you know, all this stuff because they had the word Aslan in it, you know, so there was something there that they feared. This story survived because at its root, it creates a future escape from and promise of indigenous resurgence in the face of domination and control of first the Spaniards and later the 20th century United States. These are uh, trade routes that existed. You know, as you can see, um, that's fine, let me let you do this next one. For the trade routes, the one in the middle, Camino Real, we call that, the Tierra Adentro, uh, which, went that far right there, you know, as the, and they still follow these actually. There's like freeways that follow these. Um, these right here, you know, that's why they had, uh, they exchanged uh, macaws or guacamayas. They exchanged uh, shells, jade, copper, all this whole area right here that we're talking about, you know, the, where the Utonawa people live as far south as Central America, then as far north to, to here, you know, there was commerce. You know, there was economy, there was culture. Next. Spanish conquistadors, in fact, took advantage of ancient stories of Aslan, migratory routes, economic trade routes, and cultural similarities between groups of indigenous peoples to move northward from Mesoamerica into what today is Nuevo Mexico, Arizona, Chihuahua, and Sonora, and eventually the entire Southwest. Again, in quotes. So they took advantage of those stories that existed amongst the people. They took advantage of these ties that people had up north to here, to, to uh, arrive here and colonize the whole area. After years of rebellions, insurrections, and finally a war of independence, Spain was ousted officially in 1821. The masses of indigenous peoples, both traditional and quote unquote mestizo, uh, and Africans that righteously fought would only come under the boot of another colonizer 27 years later. Under the guise of manifest destiny, claiming that God had given them, Europeans, the right to dominate from sea to shining sea, but obviously seeking expansion and domination, the USA invaded what had barely been named Mexico. And by that, I'm talking about this part of the world as well. And uh, God given right. What a, what what a group is claiming that today? It's all over the news. They claim God gave them a right to occupy the land. Israel. So let me go to similarities even with colonizers. Next. Important point. Although Mexico, like every country on earth, was formed out of colonial conditions, its history is unlike that of USA and Canada. I think it's important to understand this. Mexico is very much an Indian nation. It is very indigenous. Although after the War of Independence, a ruling Criollo elite remained, the mass of the people that fought to the death for their freedom from the Spanish crown were native and African peoples. The USA and Canada are not like this. In contrast, they are colonizers. Their quote-unquote independence wars were European versus European for native land. Natives and Africans did have a minimal presence in these wars, but in the end, natives were still subjected to extermination and Africans remained as slaves. Native and African people did not fight for independence in those wars. In contrast uh, to Mexico, Mexico, which includes this area, that, up to that point, independence, which they did. They did fight for independence here. We did fight for independence, not white people. 
The U.S. invades Mexico and in Mexico, the northern half only. It's reasoning too many Indians. They actually had debates over that. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo signed, was signed in 1848. That's actually why New Mexico and I think Arizona became official states like very late, like in the 40s, because that's when white people were a majority in those states. Up to that point, Mexicanos, natives, because again, they didn't really see a difference. They only said, well, these are Catholic and speak Spanish. And these other people don't, but they both are the same. Up to that point, we were still the majority in those states. And we're the majority now, actually. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's a depiction of uh, one of the battles. Next. That's an AI, <laughs> an AI uh, of the Southwest. <laughs> but wait, if those borders are based on colonialism, is it recognizing that also being colonial? Next. <laughs> this is an important point that I think uh, we need to understand. Colonization's legacy is that it artificially divided up the world for its own needs. Yes, it did that. It divided up the world. They cut up Africa, they cut up Asia, they cut up even parts of Europe, they cut up uh, our continent for their own, uh, their own greed. Yet, out of that arose new peoples and nations with legitimate struggles for national liberation. So again, this landmass, talking about here, uh, shares a pre-invasion, pre-Hispanic, as we say, ancient past with Mexico and Central America. It underwent the Spanish colonial period and independence and is now artificially severed from the rest of the, of the same landmass. It has been connected to culturally, politically, economically, et cetera, for a millennia. So I'm talking about this area. It was severed from the rest of the continent. Uh, colonization, so that's an example of what I just said, what we just said. Colonization once again reshapes and reorganizes an entire landmass and people to its own needs. The so-called Southwest with its unique history and culture, heavily native and very Mexican, is now subjected once again to a new reality, U.S. invasion and occupation. The territories once Mexican and always native birthed a new people. This is nothing new. This has happened throughout history. Next. Examples. Next. We all know the heroic Vietnamese people. French colonialism carved out, quote unquote, French Indochina. From it, its peoples fought wars of national liberation once they consolidated their national identities. There was no Vietnam before. The people were there, you know, but there was no nation of Vietnam that didn't exist. But are we to forget the heroic Vietnamese people that fought, fought, they had millions of people that died fighting the French and then the United States who stepped in after that. They fought heroically, those are some people that we should look up to, you know, um, and they said we are Vietnamese, no matter if we're in the north or the south, wherever we may be, we are Vietnamese and we will fight for our nation. Even if, and I'm sure they would say back then the French would probably say, well, there's no Vietnam, what are you talking about? If they were saying there's a Vietnam, that means there's a Vietnam. And that's Ho Chi Minh, Uncle Ho. South Africa. Dutch and British colonialism carved out what I'm called South Africa. Yet her people fought a heroic struggle against colonialism as well. You might know that as the apartheid, anti-apartheid struggle. Um, there was no Africa prior to colonization. And what I mean, I mean, obviously the continent we know as Africa was there, the people were there. But no one called it Africa. Um, much less a South Africa prior to colonization. Nevertheless, it became a reality to contend with. There's two leaders of the South African struggle. They were actually uh, married, partners for a while, Winnie and Nelson Mandela. Um, there's an image of the Soweto uprising in the background. You know, South Africa had all sorts of different um, indigenous groups. They had migrants from other countries like Mozambique and other countries that went, would go to South Africa to work, but they all united as South Africans to fight against apartheid. Are we to deny that they exist? No. Oh. Next. 
And this next one is all over the news nowadays. The British mandate, authorized by the League of Nations colonizers, carved out Palestine from the territories formerly under the rule of the Ottoman Empire, the land of Palestine. It was called the land of Palestine, but it wasn't an actual nation. And the Transjordan. The Palestinian National Charter, the founding document of the PLO, and there's a whole other presentation I've on this, which is the type of Palestinian Declaration of Independence, even acknowledges, Palestinians even acknowledge, Article 2, Palestine, with the boundaries it had during the British Mandate, is an indivisible territorial unit. There was no Palestinian state or nation prior to British and now US-funded Zionist colonialism. But there is a Palestine today, and that is the point. Colonialism carved out these people. These are three examples. Carved out these three, uh, just examples. There's like examples all over history. They carved them out. They didn't exist before. But out of that came legitimate struggles. So again, there says restructuring the world. They did restructure the world. But legitimate new nations are born of that. Are we to deny Palestine? Are we to deny Vietnam? Are we to deny South Africa? No. Those are people that we have to look up to. New nations with ancient roots actually decolonized under these new conditions. They fought wars of liberation. So I think it's important to point out this word because nowadays all over social media you hear decolonize this, decolonize that. And you know, it's like uh, you just, with all the respect, if you do a land acknowledgement, like, oh, he's decolonized. Oh, okay, yeah, the, the, the mayor did a land acknowledgement. Oh, well, no, no, no. Decolonization, these people actually decolonized their nations. They fought bitter wars of liberation to oust a colonizer. That is decolonizing. Palestine is fighting that right now. They are decolonizing, you know, as, as, as terrible as that might look, right? But there's people that are fighting to the dead to defend their people. That is decolonization. Not this whole, you know, well, I'm going to eat something else in my salad. <laughs> or whatever. You know, uh, okay, that's good for your health. You should do that. You know, maybe I should do that. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, we want to, we're actually talking about actual decolonization of the land, of the land. And an important point, which, you know, flies over the head of a lot of people nowadays national unity being the decisive and long-lasting weapon of resistance. Again, what does this mean? National unity. Like Vietnam, like South Africa, like Palestine. They know who they are. Palestinians, this is the thing that Palestinians have said, we already won. They have said that, we already won. Why? Because from the oldest person to the youngest baby, they know they are Palestinian, and they cannot break that. They cannot break that. Just like the Vietnamese who faced the United States and fought the same, they fought tanks, they fought, you know, fighter jets and attack helicopters and all these horrible bombs that destroyed so much of, of their land. But they knew they were Vietnamese. Nobody was going to change their mind. Nobody, absolutely nobody. That's national unity. That's a weapon. That's a weapon that if it's strong, you cannot break of people. So, yeah, that's... <laughs> Uh, this is a quote from a book. If people are very are interested in learning more about Chicanos, uh, this book is actually out of print. Supposedly they're going to print it again. I hope so. Um, it should be like basic knowledge for any, any Chicano studies class, of course. Uh, it's called Azteca del Norte. It was written by Jack Forbes, who was Renape Renape descent. He was native. Um, and it's actually the first documented mention of Aslan in the whole land of Chicanos. I say that because a lot of people think it was Alurista, if you know any of that to say. Alurista was the one that wrote the Plan Aslan, and that came out in 68. Well, this came out in 62. And it says, the Azteca del Norte, and Azteca is a person of Aslan of the Southwest, composed the largest single tribe or nation of Anishinaabe Indians found in the United States today. Like other Native American groups, the Azteca of Aslan are not completely unified or homogenous people. Some call themselves Chicanos and see themselves as people whose true homeland is Aslan. Right, so that was written in 1962. So where is Aslan? <laughs> and here, uh, I'm going to try to not make it all confusing. Dialectical and historical materialism. 
because I want to explain how we see history, right? How we understand history, you know, how a lot of other peoples have come to understand history and how this is a tool to, to better grasp reality. In philosophy, there are two basic ways of explaining the world, materialism and idealism. Materialism states that matter, the real world comes before ideas. So the real world makes ideas. For the real world. The materialistic approach or study studies the real world and makes conclusions based on their outcome. An example of materialism, science, knowledge branches. They study reality, and out of that, they make their conclusions. Idealism states that ideas come before matter. So they believe that you have an idea and that shapes the world. Uh, an idealistic approach makes conclusions or declarations without studying the real world. And with all due respect, I don't mean that it's insulting, religion is like that. Racism, sexism, so they have these ideas and they say, this is the way the world is. But they are not studying reality, they're just making these conclusions. You know, um, yeah. Hope that makes sense. Um, the dialectic. Originally, it meant arriving at truth through dialogue. In philosophy today, it also explains how everything is interconnected and in constant flux. So think about this when we're talking about, you know, this landmass, this idea of Aslan, and all those other ones that we talked about, affecting each other uh, and developing something new out of something old, over and over and over. These are the three laws of dialectics, the law of transformation of quantity to quality, the law of inter interpretation of opposites, Interpenetration of opposites and the law of negation of the negation. We're just going to leave it at that. <clears throat> Next. When you apply materialism, seeing the world as it is, and dialectical, you use a dialectical approach, science, you can use dialectical materialism as a tool to understand human society and history. And there we have workers. See, it's a tool to understand reality. So let's recap using historical materialism. The United States invades, and again, this is stuff that has happened. The United States invades and annexes a portion of land with an already vibrant history for a millennium. Part of that history is what led it to be invaded by Spain. A most recent part of that history is what made that portion of land Mexico after independence from Spain. Clearly, this portion of territory does not share the same history with the rest of the United States. So this part that we're getting called the Southwest has its own history apart from the United States. Like all the stuff that you learn about, you know, the 13 colonies and the 4th of July and the Civil War, none of that happened here. That never happened here. I mean, maybe in Texas it happened in, in one half of it, but that's because they took that over right before that happened because they wanted to have slaves in Texas. But other than that, none of that happened here. So we have our own unique history, even going back thousands of years, we have our own unique history that connects us with the rest of Mexico and Central America. It relegates, in the United States, the people native to these territories to barrios, reservations, and pueblos. Despite not wanting more of our people, it drastically needs manual labor, physical labor, to build up its economic power. It allows for migration, but criminalizes the migrant for political purposes. Mesoamerican, Mexicano, now Centro Americano migrants arrive into already existing Chicano, Mexicano, native barrios of the now Southwest. So I say already existing because a lot of barrios already existed. Uh, where my family is from in San Fernando, Barrio San Fernando, the old part of San Fernando, um, if you were, when the United States arrived, if you were considered Mexican, which meant you were Italian, which they didn't have that word back then, but if you were you know, from a tribe, or if you were a Mexicano that just arrived, you had to live in that part of town. So that's where my family is from. So those barrios already existed. And now, obviously, all of San Fernando, basically, the barrio. You know, um, and I'm sure that's the story here, también, in all different parts of Los Angeles, throughout the Southwest. Some of the oldest parts of town is where the Mexicans, the Chicanos have been. And that's because that's where the native people had to live as well. The ones that weren't pushed to the reservations. Um, next. 
just as they have for thousands of years, Gaza migrates now northward into what many begin calling Islam. Only this time they don't migrate for natural reasons, but rather because of US interventions, capitalism and imperialism, obviously colonialism here. Uh, the territories once Mexico and always native begin to have huge population centers of Chicano, Mexicanos, and Raza. Okay. Okay. We're not making that up. I mean, we are making it up kind of because we have babies. <laughs> you know, that's not a fabrication of, you know, my ideas. You know, the idea comes from that. I think, you know, nobody can make that. So that's the you know, is it a coincidence? Okay. Is it a coincidence? Look at that. And then the next slide. Currently, we are, that's our percentages. New Mexico, California, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, Skip, Florida, Colorado. <laughs> um, is it a coincidence those are the states with the largest Latino population? It's no coincidence. Uh, next. And this is the quote. Some of these, if you saw the other presentation, I took from that because I think that explains what I'm trying to uh, get to here. And this is uh, Juan Gonzalez, who's from Democracy Now. He said this after uh, Trump was defeated. And he said, and what has happened now is that there is a new brown belt voting bloc that is developing in the Southwest that includes Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, and very soon Texas as well. He's not counting California because California is already considered, you know, uh, not go Republican. And obviously, I'm not advocating for the Democrats by saying that, but it's saying that there is a unique group of people in this land, right, who are becoming the majority, who have ancient roots there, um, and who vote a specific way because they have certain interests as a people. Next. Chicano, Mexicano, Raza labor builds up the Southwest, quote unquote, Southwest from laying railroad tracks to agriculture. So as a matter of fact, for a period of time after they excluded Chinese people, it was Mexicanos that built most of the train tracks um, significantly. Uh, agriculture, obviously the agriculture, La Raza is the economic driving force in the region. California and Texas are now the both the largest contributors of GDP to the US economy. California and Texas, is that a, is that a coincidence? No. Next. This is a study, uh, 2023 US Latino GDP report. Source is the International Monetary Fund. Again, we're not making this up. And it says, this report said this. This is not a Chicano movement group. It's not anything, it's not a movement on the left. So like International Monetary Fund. If Latinos in the US were an independent country, they said that, the researchers found that GDP would be the world's fifth largest, outpacing even the United Kingdom, France, and India among the 10 largest GDPs in the world. Then the US Latino GDP grew at the second fastest rate across 2020 and 2021. Only China GDP grew faster. And despite being only 19% of the US population, Latinos, or as we say, La Raza, were responsible for 39% of the growth of US real GDP during 2020 and 2021. They are saying this. There's something there that they are saying um, about us as a people that are becoming the majority in a certain part of the world that we've been in for a thousand years, um, that again, have certain interests that they will vote on. Again, I'm not advocating for the Democrats, neither the Republican obviously, but those are things to keep in mind. In a sense, the United States created the basis for Islam in the modern world out of its domestic needs. It should then be no surprise that thousands of years later, the notion of a homeland coming from a colonized indigenous people in this part of the world will once again push through time as Aslan. So that's not a coincidence. Obviously, it's going to happen. If you have a group of people who are dispossessed of their land, and this group of people is a mixture of native tribes, is a mixture of Mexicanos, is a mixture now with Centro Americanos, is a mixture of, of uh, people that are half, you know, part, you know, is the half and half, listen, is that it's no surprise that these people are gonna think of a homeland for themselves. 
just like all other peoples have, from Vietnam to South Africa to Palestine, they have said, well, this is ours. This is our land. This is where we originate from. This is our story. It's no surprise. Aslan. Okay. Okay, next. Other colonized peoples have recognized the struggle for Aslan, including other indigenous and native First Nations. This was Bill Wapepa. He already passed away. He was the, the chair of the International Indian Treaty Council. This is a short document in which they recognize um, Chicanos as being indigenous people. And part of all the indigenous struggles, they recognize the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo as being one of many treaties the United States has violated uh, with indigenous people. And they recognize Chicanos as being native to the land of Aslan. And it says that in there. And it was kind of blurry. Um, and then the letter over there was written to my father. My father was the chair of La Rasmida back in the 80s. And it's asking, you know, for La Rasmida to continue participating with the International Indian Treaty Council. That they really want, you know, the partido because they view the partido with, you know, so much respect and, and that, you know, the struggle of the raza and all that. That was Bill Wapepa. That was the International Indian Treaty Council recognizing Chicanos as being indigenous as well. Recognizing Aslan, saying, hey, you're part of us. Saying, you're not different. You're a part of us. You're indigenous people like us. We've been all fractured by this beast. We've got to fight it together. They were saying that. Right? So that's important to recognize. Next. Other colonized people that have recognized Chicanos? Palestinians. Uh, La Rasunina delegation to Lebanon in 1980 that met with Palestinian liberation organization leadership, including their founder, Yasser Arafat, who's in the middle. <laughs> And you can actually find this online in the picture. Google La Raza in Palestine or Chicano Palestine. Um, a lot of the right wingers in the 2000s were horrified of this. They were using this to say, we got to get rid of Mecha. You know, um, yeah. But see, they, they have also recognized Chicanos uh, and Aslan in our struggle. So if this is true, does it mean that the United States created an entity that could supersede it? And that's a picture of the Chicano moratorium, and I put it because I really like that, because that symbolizes what we're talking about. Indians of all tribes. That was the spirit of the Chicano movement. It brought together all sorts of indigenous people and the, the identity of being Chicano and, and the identity of Aslan to the land. It united masses, thousands upon thousands of indigenous people Obviously, many of those Mexican descent, but it united us as one people. And that's when we moved. And we were only 8 million. We're over 40 million now. You know? okay. As the USA, which began on the East as a capitalist enterprise, what I mean by that is the pilgrims, you hear about the pilgrims, and oh my God, they were escaping. Uh, persecution, no, they were actually sent there by corporations uh, uh, to make money because they were trying to figure out how do we colonize this whole area. So they would send groups of people to colonize areas and see how long they lasted before they starved for that. So that's what the pilgrims were. They weren't like these people, oh my God, we're, you know, pobrecitos. They went there, they were getting paid, and they went there by these private interests. So as the USA, which began as that, and a mixture of European nationalities that became one American nationality create its complete opposite and demise on the West with a mixture of mainly indigenous people that have and can identify as Chicano and a mostly working class people whose well being lays not in capitalism but in building socialism. So, did the United States create its opposite on the other side, on the West Coast? Keep that in mind. Next. So these are their words, right? This was Samuel Huntington. That's a muyo, bueno, pero he didn't take the United States with him. But um, these were his words. Samuel Huntington, again, was not just like some whatever guy. He's credited to giving, having given the foundation to the Trump movement. And I say he was, he was a founder of the Trilateral Commission. He worked under the, the Johnson administration. And said, he said this. In a document called the Hispanic Challenge, you could actually find that online. 
The persistent inflow of, of Hispanic immigrants threatens to divide the United States into two peoples, two cultures, and two languages. Unlike past immigrant groups, Mexicans and other Latinos have not assimilated into mainstream U.S. culture, forming instead their own political and linguistic conflicts. No other immigrant group in U.S. history has asserted or could assert a historical claim to U.S. territory. Mexicans and Mexican Americans can and do make that claim. Almost all of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, and Utah was part of Mexico until Mexico lost it as a result of the Texan War of Independence in 35 to 36 and the Mexican American War of 1846 to 48. Mexico is the only country that the United States has invaded, occupied its capital, placing the Marines in the halls of Montezuma, and then annexed half its territory. Mexicans do not forget these events. Quite understandably, they feel that they have special rights in these territories. Unlike other immigrants, Boston College political scientist Peter Scarry notes, Mexicans arrive here from a neighboring nation that has suffered military defeat at the hands of the United States, and they settle predominantly in a region, in a region that was once part of their homeland. Mexican Americans enjoy a sense of being on their own turf that is not shared by other immigrants. These people are saying that. This is what they say out in the open. This here um, is a screenshot. That, that's the only part that I could find. But if you go on the CIA website, you could search things. And of course, I went there and I searched up Chicano and whatever was Chicano, I was looking through it. It was like all these files and PDFs. And this came out. Uh, this is from the CIA website, uh, Intelligence Digest, June 81. Intelligence Digest was like this journal that you could share among CIA and other agents throughout the world. Um, and it's very highly censored. And this is the only uh, piece available in the story. So what I mean by that is like, it was a PDF, right? But uh, like the first part was just like the cover and then had some other random stuff. And then it just cuts off right there and it's talking about other stuff. But this is what it said there. When they mentioned the PLO, which is the Palestine Liberation Organization, then it says there are significant signs to the contrary. The July 1980 issue of Intelligence Digest World Report contained the following passage. Listen to this. We have for some considerable time now warned about politicizing of the Mexicans within the U.S. and the claims for lost and stolen Mexican lands. To you, uh, so you will not be unduly surprised to learn that a Washington, D.C. school board official has asked that one of the American held hostages in Iran back in the 80s, remember? be released because he is a Chicano, and that Chicanos are Mexicans who have lived under the yoke of U.S. imperial aggression and occupation since the land was stolen from Mexico in 1836 and 46. For 200 years, the Latin American countries have experienced the same kind of U.S. domination and control that Iran experienced between 53 and 79. As fellow victims of U.S. Uh, greed and racism, Iran and the Latino community must learn more about one another and stand together. And it says, of course, cover the covered Ireland, but we also showed how Mexico could claim Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah, together with part of Wyoming, Colorado, and says all that. And there are some eight to ten million illegal immigrants within the U.S. Most of them Mexican, and the president of Mexico has already indicated that the illegals, that's the way he says there, must be treated properly. The Mexicans are deeply aware of the cultural heritage. Of their cultural heritage of what the Europeans, Americans, and Spanish have done to them. With the growth of Mexican oil power and a changing relationship with the formerly but not any more all powerful US, the lines on the map will assume a political importance undreamed of by most Americans. That's the CIA saying that. The CIA of the United States saying that about us. Next. And this guy. Uh, when asked on a Playboy magazine interview, and I didn't know Playboy had great articles, <laughs> what was the greatest threat to America today? They asked this guy that. This is what then CIA director William Colby had to say. The most obvious threat is that there are 60 million Mexicans today, and there are going to be 120 million of them by the end of the century. There are 7 million or 8 million Mexicans who live in the United States today, and of the extra, 60 million who will be around by the end of the century. There's no way to keep a good 20 million of them from living in the country. We can reinforce the border patrol 
Hey, they don't have enough bullets to stop them all. That's the CIA. And notice that they're not only talking about the people, they're talking about the territory, the land. Next. And this disgraceful, disgusting, they also had this to say uh, from this book. He wrote a book. He has brains to write. Um, a Durable Peace, 1993. Benjamin and Yahoo. Okay, he says this, right? These are colonizers saying this. The United States is not exempt because they're talking about Palestine. Why the people in the U.S. should oppose Palestine? The United States is not exempt from this potential nightmare. In a decade or two, the southwestern region of America is likely to be predominantly Hispanic. Probably we don't use that word, but that's what he said. Mainly as a result of continuous immigration from Mexico. It is not inconceivable that in this community, champions of the Palestinian principle could emerge. These would demand not merely equality before the law or nationalization or even Spanish as a first language. Instead, they would say that since they form a local majority in the territory, which was formerly or forcibly taken from Mexico, they deserve a state of their own. But you already have a state. It's called Mexico would come the response. You have every right to demand civil rights in the United States, but you do not have a right, a right to demand a second Mexico. This hypothetical exchange may sound far-fetched today, but it will not necessarily appear that way tomorrow, especially if the Palestinian principle is allowed to continue to spread, which it surely will if a new Palestinian state comes into being. So they recognize our potential. They recognize our similarities with other colonized people. Do we? Next. Everything this Mansell has said. Next. I don't want to see this face. The United States, like Spain before it, has taken advantage of ancient patterns of migration present in this land for thousands of years. Again, it has allowed migration while criminalizing, criminalizing the migrants. In times of economic depression, it escaped both Raza migrants in general and Mexicanos in particular. Nevertheless, large numbers of Mexicano and Raza migrants have stayed in established Chicano native communities. This has allowed for a steady flow of Chicano manual labor and super exploited undocumented Raza labor. So if you know, like for example, you know any of the history of LA, East LA was that. It was where all the Mexicano, the Chicano, the indigenous people would live. And then you cross the bridge, you wouldn't work. I came back and you stayed in your place. That's how it was where, where my family is from, San Fernando Pacoima. You that's you lived in that area, then you went to the other side to work, or you worked in the field, and there were fields there before. Um but yeah, it, having us here, even though they say they don't want us, even though they took the land from us, but having us has provided this cheap labor for them. Whether you're Chicano or Mexicano or Centro Americano and you just crossed the border. You know, that's what, that's what we have provided for them economically. But they have been seeing their own demise by letting us grow in our own land. Yeah. These communities have grown by the millions in the territories annexed from Mexico. Clearly, it is vital for the USA to keep this community in help propagate from developing a sense of a national consciousness and thus a national identity. This explains the constant erasure of terms such as Chicano, La Raza, and Aslan, as they are reflective of a national consciousness. So these three words here have been under attack from the beginning, from the beginning, and not, I mean, some of the first people to attack it, like in the 80s, were all the vendidos who started calling themselves Hispanics. Even uh, the National Council of La Raza, I changed his name, not that long ago, but in the 80s, they changed uh, even that. They had that in their constitution. They had it, the Aslan and La Raza and Chicano. They changed all that back then. But they, they're the Rendidos. You know, so, and Chicano studies is always under attack. Why? Because it's called Chicano or Chicano or Chicanex studies. Um, all these words are constantly under attack all the time because they reflect this. These words come from our people. When we had nothing, we had no name. We didn't even have, and I say this with respect, but our, because they're Chicanos too, they're Raza. But some of the tribes here uh, that now are coming out, like, oh, this is what our name is. 
They didn't have those names before. They, were, they, they had the word for Batavia or Tongma or Kish. They didn't have that before. They tried to dig into their languages to make these words. So back then when all of us had nothing, we said, we are Chicanos. We are La Raza. It has nothing to do with Vasconcelos. And this land, that we have no name for it, we're going to call her Aslan. It's Aslan. It's from comes from that old story. Aslan. That was everybody. It came from us. It came from nothing. That's why those words are so powerful and dangerous. Denying this also denies this community from realizing their attachment to this land, to understanding that we belong here. It is a matter of survival for the United States Empire to keep the Chicano uh, confused and perpetually an immigrant in their own land. And I don't say immigrant in a, in a, in a bad way, but I'm saying they put that mentality in us that we don't belong here, that we should be grateful to them, that we're outsiders, that we're, we, you know, thank you for letting me be here and be exploited in this land, which you come from, you know, is that they need to put that, because you see that even my family are Chicanos. But you see people sometimes, the vendidos who want to be Trump supporters, like, oh, well, you know, it's not Mexico. You know, where does that mentality come from? Because you're thinking of yourself as an immigrant, as an outsider that should be grateful to the United States. No, man, they came here. We didn't come, we didn't go over there. You know? <laughs> Next. So just this quote, to close off. Uh, Mankind thus inevitably sets itself only such tasks as it is able to solve. Since closer examination will always show that the problem itself arises only when the material conditions for its solution are already present, or at least in the course of formation. So there's a problem. The problem, we are a problem to the United States, and the United States is a problem to us. But there is already a solution, or it's coming into formation. Everything we talked about, there's a whole landmass and a people that belong there that can be independent, that have their own economy, have their own way of thinking, have their own culture, have their own history, have connections. I mean, the Chicanos come from native tribes. The Chicanos come from Latin America. The Chicanos can be mixed, but that's who we are. We have our own way. That's the answer, Aslan. We must organize. If you want to find a solution, let me know. Enjoy the Raza Unida. And next, gotcha. Give me So we're gonna open it up to questions. If anybody has a question, we can pass the mic to you, or you can just stand up and, and give your question. Okay. Comments, questions. If you like it, you can let me know. <laughs> you know, um, the document that you just shared with the CIA, do you know what it said about the PLO? This is something about what they did it in was, Lebanon. It was saying it was comparing um like different struggles for independence. I could actually if anyone wants to wants if the I have a sign-in sheet. I guess I'm working on having like the whole like bibliography and all that for this, but I can send it to you. Uh, but it was comparing like Ireland. Who, Northern Ireland, they're also fighting for independence. And uh, they were comparing that, like, that situation, like, the situation as extreme as it was in Palestine could be in Ireland. And then they're saying how the situation in Ireland could happen here. But it, it just cuts off right there. So, yeah, that's, that's why they mentioned the PLO. Anyone else? Hey, I have a question. Um, okay. You, you said that, like, colonialism creates. Well, after the process of colonialism has ended, it creates this new, like, national identity. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, like, what is, like, this, uh, if, like, we, if Spanish colonialism happened in Mexico already, like, mid-1800s, and, like, now when the Chicano movement started, like, the 1960s, like, mm -hmm. like, where, like, where does the obsession with Aslan come from, if we, if using that, like, um, common sense of all oh, colonialism happened, we have this new sense of national identity, which is Mexico. Like why, what's the obsession with us one? No, well, it would be, so the rest of Mexico is still Mexico. Sure. This northern part is no longer Mexico. So you have this group of people developing here, who are, you know, are we Mexicanos? 
Are we American? You know, and this, I mean, this could even go into like the principle on what is a Chicano. But Chicano started, I mean, the word Chicano has been around for a very long time as well. It used to be used, you know, like I know from what I hear, my great grandfather, they would call the people that would just come, they would call them Chicanos. You know, there are uh, places they would call the more native looking people Chicanos. So that word was already existing because people were trying to figure out, well, who are we? When the Zutsu movement or the Zutsu, the Pachuco era happened in that time period, you know, people started saying, oh, we're Chicanos because we're from here. You know, we're not from Mexico. And we're not American. We're from here, though. We're different. We're Chicanos. So it's a new people. So that was saying, like, there's this new people all the way from Texas to California and even in the Midwest with those other Mexicano communities. We are Chicanos. So you have a group of people who are saying, well, this is who I am. I'm neither that, I'm neither this. But also, I'm from here. What do I call this land that I'm from? You know, so that arises out of that. You know, it wasn't like, one person said it, this is going to be Aslan now. It came it gradually, just like Chicano, it came gradually from the people. You know, like, oh, Aslan. Said, okay, that makes sense. You know, this whole land, Aslan. You know, um, but yeah, I mean, does that kind of answer? Because, you see, it's something that in Mexico, people aren't thinking about Aslan. People are thinking about that here. And because people here are asking, like, well, what about us, man? You know, what about our land? What about this land that I come from? You know, it's not Mexico, exactly. It's not the United States, <laughs> you know, that's kind of our case. You know, what is it? Aslan, it kind of fit, it fit that picture. So it was like a, like a, like, like a land made for people, made for people who were not really sure, not, they weren't from Mexico, but they weren't from the U.S. either. Yeah, it was like a new people. Like, it's kind of, kind of like I was, like, I gave an like, uh, example of Vietnam. So obviously the people were already there, right? But there was no Vietnam prior to that. They used to, they, the French called it French Indochina. Prior to that, it was just like different small states or cultural areas, but there was no Vietnam the way it is now. So after a time, people started saying, well, we share a common culture in this portion of French Indochina, we're Vietnamese. You know, then another part said, we are Cambodian. Another part said, we are um, Laos, you know, it's the, so those didn't exist. So in the same kind of process, similar, but not exactly the same, people started, you know, identifying on their own. And we're, this is our people. And we're composed of these different cultural groups, but now we become one, you know? And that's kind of like the Chicanos are. Again, I like to make that point because I think incorrectly, a lot of people think Chicanos are just Mexican. And no, Chicanos, one, the first Chicanos, it can be argued, came from tribes that were here, but they were viewed as Mexicanos because they were Catholic. And they spoke Spanish when the United States came here. That's why a lot of tribes, like for example, in LA, in the Southern California, weren't recognized as tribes. They were just, the United States just took them like Mexicans. And there was other Mexicanos that lived among them. They're just Mexicans, you know? Um, but as the, the Chicanos, and eventually there's been added influence from Central America, from Central American, Raza has come, and their children they have here grow up like Chicanos. There's been a lot of Ch uh, Chicanos that are of Central American descent. A lot of people that identify as Chicanos, they're Central Americanos. There's been Filipinos that are identified as Chicanos. You know, so it's this new people. You know, it's not exactly just Mexican descent. The majority, yes, obviously, because this land was formerly part of Mexico and Mexico's like right there. But it's a new people that are in development. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so I mean, a great presentation. Uh, a lot of the presentation was about, I mean, all of it basically, was about our connection, you know, Lara's connection to the land maps. But I'm very interested also, uh, if you could speak to like the development of, you know, what we now see today, uh, the population growth of most of the places that, you know, economists would call the Sun Belt, right? Which mm -hmm. is all, all here. Mm -hmm. uh, take place between the 1940s and 1970s. like. Houston is like 500,000 people in like 1930, by 1940 they had more, uh, by, by 1950 they had more. The same thing with Phoenix, same thing with Albuquerque. Los Angeles is a little bit of an exception, but for the most part, all these cities, what they call the Southwest, what we call Los um, have these huge population growth between the 40s and 70s. And this is a time period of the Brasero program. This is yeah. a time period of like, of, of Mexican labor being kind of underneath all that. So I mean, you just have to a little bit about it. I think the larger that... role, the general yeah. area of the economy. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that shows again, you know, how our labor, uh, our people have been used by this empire to sustain it, 
You know, it's like when they did the one day without a Mexican, the one day without the Raza or whatever. But this economy would collapse, it would completely collapse because it needs our labor. It needs our people out there building the cities, picking the fruits and doing all that stuff, uh, working the, the retail stores, working, you know, uh, the service industry. It needs us. It needs us. And it's allowed, you know, again, that's like when I said it, uh, it needs, you'll see all these politicians, especially, you know, Trump and all these other people, like, oh, the immigrants and this and that. All these people, their language are from Mars or whatever. You know, they say all this stuff. But at the same time, the United States has allowed migration, you know, because they need that cheap labor. You know, white people are not going to do that. You know, it's the, they need that cheap labor. They need people that are, that are going to do that work because they want to survive. But they're at that point, they need to survive. You know, it's the, so um, it's like that, you know, I guess that's what I was, I was trying to make that point, how, you know, like dialectics and all that, they, you know, they say they don't need us, but they need us. And uh, they, they say we don't belong here, but we, we do, you know, and they say we're useless, but hey man, if it wasn't for us, the United States would collapse completely. And all these cities, you know, the whole economy was saved by the Raza labor, but they don't want to accept that, you know. Yeah. I guess what I'm just making is, is not only are they dependent on it was built on it. Without it, it would cities wouldn't exist at the scale. We That's know right. ancient thousands of years. Yes, all it's true, but like cities of millions, metro, these metropolises would not exist but for our labor. Yeah. Like these cities would not exist simply because they, you look at the population growth no, strength. It all is tied to the time in which we were being brought in, kicked out, brought in, kicked mm -hmm. out, brought in, kicked out. Yeah. And that's when these cities exploded. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, you're right, they wouldn't exist at all. You know, not think of California, <clears throat> an example I like to think about, again, is the Central Valley, again, with the Central Valley, you know, it's the, but it's all agricultural, you know, who does all that work? Campesinos, the Raza, there's Filipinos in there, I consider them Raza, it's the, uh, they do all that work, and that part of the world is the 15th largest economy on earth, from brown hands, brown hands steeped in the sun, picking your grapes, picking your everything that's there, you raising the livestock and all that, they're making that economy. If it wasn't for them, that would not even exist. You know, so and that's a great point. But I mean, we built all this; it would not exist without us. You know, you see the people doing construction; it's all raza, whether it's union Chicanos or it's migrant workers; it's all raza doing that work, building the cities. Building the suburbs, you know, building all these things, you know, but uh, we don't belong here, according to them. We're still here. We're still here. Uh, can you talk about like the tactics that are used um, by white people as, as far as like the the present sense colonialism and like gentrifying uh, brown and black communities and how they're able to just consistently do it across the country? As a Oh, oh yeah. like how like how white people are able to uh gentrify oh. um black and brown communities so 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 easily. Well, I mean I think that comes from their economic standing and the way like the world is again being restructured economically, right? Like I said, um a lot of our labor has taken different forms, right? It's not like we don't have a factory that we go to every day anymore. You know, it's the, and so the communities, the whole city is being restructured, where now you have like all these, you know, white yippies, who it's more in, their, in, their, in the favor of that economy to have these white yippies living closer to the metropolis than the poor people who used to live there. You know, thank you. Um, so it's restructuring all that, and obviously they have the money to do that, right? Like, even where I live, for example, I live in Pacoima, right? Pacoima is like this community. Uh, I bought my house. Yeah, 16 years ago. No, oh, 15 years ago. Um, when the economy crashed, when I had a good job, and I was I was pretty young. When I had a good job and I bought it, uh, all the houses around me, I can't afford that. No one that lives there now can afford that. And so people naturally they move to Palmdale and Lancaster. And you have even I think from here people move over there or Riverside. So you have huge Chicano populations out there, huge African populations out there that have moved from LA because they could no longer live in these areas who are they're they're uh, artificially, you know, the, the living uh standard from some young is being raised because it's not like natural, you know. So people there can no longer afford that, so they have to move out 
you know, and, and they their labor now, you know, they either have to come all the way in the city. You see some of these metro rails being built, being built for that so that people can come from even farther into the city, uh, or they're working all the retail areas in those out in those areas, building those areas. But you know, it's like the whole destruction of, of, of the economy. And the poor people can no longer live where they have lived. The colonized people can no longer live in the traditional areas. You know, it's the so yeah, I mean, you have someone that has like a thousand of dollar job, they can come and just buy this off like nothing, you know. Some corporation can just come and buy this off like nothing. And what can people do? You know, so they could organize, but all. yeah, I mean, I know it does that kind of yeah, answer. Yeah. So yeah, it's like all the structure, right? And but they yeah, they come in with the same mentality. You know, it's the, there was nothing here before. It was all, you know, ghetto before. You know, the, uh, kind of the, the disparaging thing that they say about Palestine. They kind of say the same things about the barrio or the ghetto. You know, like, oh, it was, you know, what was coming out of here? You know, criminals or whatever? You know, what did they say about Palestine? What coming out of here? Terrorists? You know, they have this whole colonizer mentality that they're bringing something that we should thank them for. You know, if we stay there, we should thank them that they let us stay there, you know? That whole colonizer mentality, the same thing, you know? And they're coming to fix something, you know, and then they put that into other people's minds that are colonized. You see some Chicanos and some African brothers and sisters always say, oh, don't you want the neighborhood to, to improve? Yeah, but with the people there not having to move out, you know, because that's not even the same neighborhood anymore, you know? So, in order to use the model of white men to kind of um, uh, fill the point that you're making, a lot of white people that you put a person on hunger. Where's the documentation from our community? Do you have did you make that available as well? Not just quotes from a bunch of white men and white leaders, white men in particular. Like how do we have access to our own history in order to reinforce everything that you're saying? Yeah. Like where where like what's the depot for those sources, not just not just white people? No, I have one white guy that I that I a pal with Marx, a lot, and then the other guy was African. Oh, no, no, I'm saying and, the French Union Italian, like all these other oh, things that, that kind of reinforce that what they're saying about what's happening in the Southwest. Yeah. Like historically, where are yeah, our own. Where's our source? Yeah. yeah. That, no, that's a good question, but it's the a Chicano history. See, the reason I, I, I wanted to include some of that, but I'm trying to. I'm trying to uh, move people away from my idea that it's something that we just made up in their minds. You know, I say, so I'm trying to show how those those guys who are not revolutionary in any sense, they're saying what Chicanos have been saying. You know, that this is our land, that we're, we're, we're coming to our land, that we're becoming large, you know, bigger populace, this is all ours and this and that. So I wanted to move away from the idea that only Chicanos are saying that, you know, to saying like, look, here's a proof, these people that, very much hate us are saying the same thing, you know. But you know, I could add more Chicanos or Chicanas to it. There is there's a lot, but that, but I wanted to get that idea, you know, that it's not something again, like I said, you know, like ideas don't make the world, it's the world makes the ideas. So I was trying to prove that, you know, these people that represent all these states and governments, colonizers, they are saying what we have been saying for for a very long time. But that, but it's coming from them, you know. So it's kind of like, kind of like a challenge, like. If they're saying it, do we understand it? No, but I, I could do that, brother. If I'm trying to put together a, a bibliography and all that, can you give me your information that I could email it to you or, or how? Because there's a lot of stuff that I've mentioned this about. Right. Off the top of your head, do you have some recommendations for people to read? Uh, yeah, Chicano stuff, Occupy America, Insurgent Aslan, uh, este, what else? <laughs> Matt, so if you want to get Matt. <laughs> It's the, yeah, I mean, those are three Chicanos right there. So, just to just ask that, if he, um, if we, if you have me sitting here to make a list, or if you have an email list, yeah, like along with the bibliography, can you make, can you give us those book recommendations? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, that's, uh, that's been my goal, yeah, because I want, I want people to notice. Here's a, I thought it was fun. I thought it was funny that you included. Sorry. That's all right. I just wanted to close it up just so um, if there's like other discussions, you can come to him and talk to him. Feel free to hang out and everything. I just want to be mindful of everybody's time because we did say we're going to end at 8 and it's already 8 06. So, yeah, feel free to hang out. He's going to be here so you can talk to him. Um, He's going to pass around a sign up sheet. 
some sign up to keep up with what he does and, and his recommendations. So big round of applause for the next one. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you guys for coming out. And if you can stack some chairs, that'd be amazing. But yeah, feel free to hang out, support the store, hang out with Ernesto. And if you have any other questions, here he is for you to uh, bug him about. So there it is. Okay. Thank you guys for coming out. Thank you. Uh, party party. Party party. Wow. Uh, I don't think I like your background music if you ask me. Oh, no, this is background music, but it's about to get really loud. Oh.